Georgia Grand Prix Atlanta. Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth. And welcome back to Atlanta. Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Jacob Van Lunen. We've got our quarterfinal match set up, and this is going to be fireworks here, Jake. We've got Corey Baumeister versus Ben Stark, Ramanop Red, and it is a version of Ramanop Red that Ben has tuned specifically for this tournament. Playing against Corey Baumeister, playing Teamer Energy, and I think you could say the same thing. It's a version of Teamer Energy tuned for the tournament, though Ben is, is, a, is operating with a much bigger departure from the norm here as far as the red deck goes, though interestingly, you wouldn't know it but based on the start. Not at all. I mean, the thing about Ben's deck is he's still capable of these really aggressive starts. You know, Bomat Courier and Akari Zev, he's threatening a lot of damage very quickly. And the reason Ben built his deck the way he did was because he wanted to have a strong matchup against exactly what Corey is playing. You know, here he is on the play playing against the deck that he designed his deck to punish. Yes. So this is a great position here for Ben Stark, and it is going to be a lot of pressure on Corey Baumeister to do it. Now, I got to say, though, if anybody can, it's going to be Corey, it's going to be Brad, it's going to be these players that put in the real time and the real detailed effort to understand these meta games and everything that's going on uh, in these matchups. In the meantime, Ben Stark just calmly goes, one drop, two drop, three drop, your move. Go ahead. Do your worst. Yeah, I mean, that happens a lot with this red deck, for what it's worth. But but much less often with Ben's. That, that's I mean, his, his, true. his start could have been go, treasure map. <laughs> that's absolutely <laughs> you know? true. I mean, he is still playing eight creatures that cost one mana. That's true. You know, he's still playing, um, you know, eight to ten creatures that cost two. He has four creatures that cost three. You know. What is he playing <laughs> at the two-drop slot? Uh, he has Kari Zev, yeah. and he has... Is that is that just removal besides Kariza? Yeah, I don't think he's got any other creatures. Yeah, lightning strike and a braid. Slot. Although he a lightning strike or a braid on that servant on turn two might have been better than the Kariza for what it's worth. And he's only playing two Kariza, so like this curve out is not likely. That's true. It is funny though to see it just because you're like if you're Corey, he knows what's up by now. They may mm -hmm. have even exchanged deck lists already. I didn't notice, but you know you don't. You just think, okay, well, it's a red deck, whatever. You know, I, I know what this deck does. Truth is, yeah, probably don't. And, you know, this is a big part of it. There's a huge edge game here because normally the red deck sees a card like this, like Whirler Virtuoso, and goes, oh, no, not that It's a guy. nightmare. But and for Ben, it's like, oh, a target for my, uh, for my Sand Strangler. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. And then he even gets to punish Corey a little bit if Corey decides to make the Thopter because Rampaging Ferocidon deals him damage every time a creature. And so getting him coming and going, place. isn't he? Yeah. You got to love that. And like you said, Ben's deck really laser honed at this teamer or even just energy decks in general matchup. And boy, it does look quite good right now. I am curious to see if Ben has that haymaker, though. If he can go land, it looks like not. But this is just a clean attack with only five energy for Corey. He doesn't have any really good blocks here. Uh, Even if he makes the Thopter, he doesn't have any good blocks. That's that's the problem, isn't it? He could just take the super risky line of going for the double block on the Ferocidon, but it, it just has such potential disastrous consequences with Ben having three mana and any number of burn spells available to him. Yeah, but I mean, if he's making the Thopter here, I think that's really the only thing he could be going for, right? It pretty much is. If he double blocks carries Ev, it doesn't work the way he wants anyway. It's just the Thopter dies and they bounce off each other. So he's going to take this risky block and he gets punished by Magma Spray from Stark. Buh bye. See you later. Whirler Virtuoso. Yeah, they're, you know, Ben Stark able to deal with that 2 3 and 3 energy just for one mana with the Magma Spray. The, the whole 3 mana f worth of card. Yeah, the Corey. three energy, three mana, two two bodies that are already on the battlefield, all wiped away for red. Yeah, <gasps> it's pretty nice. That's uh, a beating. <laughs> and I mean, sometimes you're in Corey's spot there, and you just don't have a choice. You know, if my yes. opponent has it, he has it. But if I if I just take damage here with my opponent having that Ferocity on the table, that menace creature, yes. these other guys, I just I'm basically conceding. So uh oh, I we got a glory bringer here for Corey. We sure do. Well, that Ferocidon's not long for this world, though. It took a bite out of crime there for sure. It did some damage to Corey passively. It also, you know, was the combat that killed the Whirler Virtuoso. Oop, there's land number four. 
Yeah. And that's oh, and it. he's got Chandra. That's just game, yeah. right? So that's you know two damage from Zoskar Mage, two damage from Chandra is four, three from Karisev is seven, and one from Pomat Courier is eight. Game, and yeah, that is exactly it. Wow, what a beating from Ben Stark. You got to feel for Corey Baumeister. He was put in a position where he needed to take high risk lines, but the downside, of course, to a high risk line is it sometimes it doesn't work. Exactly, and. Uh, you know, when you take those high-risk lines, you recognize that when you're going to get punished, you're almost certainly losing the game as a result. All right, let's take a look at Lawrence Vess. He's playing against uh, Petr Sahurik here on the other side of the table. And what do we have? Oh, Mardu Vehicles. Why is there always one of these that just hangs around while everybody yeah, else that yeah. plays it seems to not be able to do well? Well, it looks like it's Lawrence Vess's day as uh, Lawrence has Chandra facing down two Thopters, but he's also got a... Uh, Heart of Kieran that could be ready to go. Yeah, I imagine he's going to activate it here. Did he not? He chose not to, which surprises me because I imagine that, you and know, it actually ends up, up working out. Thopter, right? It ends up working out pretty well for him, though, because that Chandra could have actually shot the Heart of Kieran for four afterward, I imagine. Well, I mean, he would have got to keep his Chandra in that scenario, right? That's true. I don't know I which one's better at this point. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I... I um, I certainly would have activated my heart. Uh, it seemed like that was what was <laughs> going to happen there. Sniping one of the Thopters is also relevant. But he did not do that. And now Petter is in great position here with Chandra, a pair of Thopters. She's on five loyalty. And yeah, sure, now Lawrence can crew up the heart of Kieran, but it might be too late. I mean, he's going to have to crew up that heart of Kieran to put Chandra down to one because Chandra. To, right? has more than three counters it's just oh he went to the face petters at four. Oh, see this makes a big difference you know lawrence's deck has access to some serious reach cards and from the looks of his hand it seems like he already has a glory bringer so he's looking to draw some land that comes into play untapped have peter attack with those thopter tokens and just end the game all in one fell swoop by attacking for four so if petter leaves back just one blocker at any moment and lawrence gets that land that glory bringer is going to end the game So he made mana to go Vraska. Wow. And that's Seeking powerful. some relics here. She may have found one. Crunch. There goes Heart of Kirin. Petter at a precarious four life, but taking away the biggest threat from the other side of the battlefield. Petter's just passed the turn back because here comes Fatal Push to take down a Thopter. Yeah, now if he draws a land, he wins the game right here even from this board state. Did he find it? It does not look like it. So it's another glory bringer. Oh. Uh. Now, Petter does have two mana available as well. I wonder if he has anything in his hand that could interact here, a harness lightning or something along those lines. Yeah, and if, if Petter did have a harness lightning in hand, then this game would essentially be locked up anyway. Lords did play that very well, though, by, you know, by not... Um, sacrificing the uh, he, he had the option last turn to sacrifice the heart of Kieran to uh, you know the, the Pia mm -hmm. in order to make it so that Petter would not get that treasure mm -hmm. but he chose not to and instead to fatal push the 1-1 one, one, and okay. that meant that his opponent only had one flying blocker so if he, he set himself up there beautifully so that if he drew a land he was going to win the game as long as there wasn't a hardest lightning in Petter's hands so great setup there from Lawrence Sometimes it just doesn't work how you draw it up. Yeah, he's got to keep fighting here, so he's going to attack. And Petter looks like he's considering a block. Nope, oh, take two. Yeah, so now better well, down to two. It's dangerous. I mean, he took two anyway. <laughs> it's going to cycle a land. I mean, he can wipe the board here. He can just go minus Raska kill something, minus Chandra kill something, and have an empty board with the Chandra on three. 
if he's, you know, really feeling the pressure. And it is getting sketchy, make no doubt. Yeah, I mean, he's at two. Yeah. Like, he needs to he needs to do something to preserve his life total. And aggressively so. Bristling Hydra looks fine. It does mean that getting attacked down on the ground by PNLR is more difficult. Yeah, I mean, he... He needs either two blockers or a removal spell and a blocker here. Yeah, I mean, he has two removal spells literally sitting on the board. He can use those how he wants. He has to figure out what's going to set him best for the long term while taking on yeah. the least risk, right? Like, Yeah, I mean, he's almost certainly, like, if he wants to use these as his removal spells for the turn, mm -hmm. then he probably wants to use the Vraska to minus here because the Chandra is only one turn away from ultimating, mm. which can then close the game very quickly and prevent his opponent from... Okay, this is pretty know, good, too. Yeah, this is ideal. Especially if you can get a harness lightning or something going. Of course, he's got to think about a lot of different cards from this deck. So here we go. He's going to leave the Thopter alive. So. And, and he's got to have something to kill the Thopter, though I guess he technically could take a hit from it. It feels risky. It feels very, very risky. Is he just going to play out the Bristling Hydra? He is. He still has that Chandra activation, though. Yeah, he's going to go ahead and just clear the board. So as we mentioned near the onset of that turn, he just decided to wipe the board away. Okay, there's a Scrounger, but I did see a Glorybringer in hand for Lawrence, did I not? Yeah, he has two Glorybringers in hand. Okay. So, you know, he has another turn here where if he draws a land... Shields are down. He's going to be able to win this game. Untap land? No, it's a concealed courtyard. Oh, my and goodness Anderson gracious. Battlefield tapped. <laughs> oh. oh, Lawrence is like, just one time. Show me that beautiful full art mountain off the top of my <laughs> <Yeah>. library. <laughs> and instead, it's a tapped dual land, and Petter gets to survive another turn. And Petter... Ooh, he found an abrade. He can use that. Yeah, um, I mean, still just, not good enough, though, to save him not. from the Glorybringer on the following turn. Petter needs to have a removal spell up or multiple flying blockers by the time he passes this turn back. And despite having these Planeswalkers in play for seemingly forever, Lawrence is going to be able to squeak this one out from the looks of things. does feel like it. He's going to buy back the Scrounger eating up that Toolcraft Exemplar. But Petter needs to have Harness Lightning here or something similar because here's Glorybringer. And that's it. And that's it. Rawr. Wow. Dragons. Threatening a Glorybringer for back-to-back -back turns. Misses on land, then finds one, but it's tapped, and then just still casts it and kills Petter anyway. It was so funny because he set himself up that game so well to, like, hit his out. He missed it, and then... His opponent ended up just, like, not drawing very well for a few turns, and he hit it two turns later, and it still mattered enough to win in the game. Really well played there. Trey, Trey uh, Van Cleve is playing against Alex Lloyd here. And it sounds like we've got one approach having been cast already for Alex. So Trey really has a lot of pressure on him to finish off this game. He's only got Alex down to nine, which is pretty high life total, total all told. Yeah. And I believe that's just a land in hand for Trey. As you see, I couldn't quite see it, but... Yeah, I only see a land in hand for him also. And he, you know, he can throw that at, at, at Alex, and uh, he does have a lot of damage lined up with Ramanop Ruins and his Scavenger Grounds, but, you know, if Alex can find an approach, it's just game over immediately. Yeah, I think what Trey's trying to figure out now is, okay, if I discard the card in my hand to hazard it, and then I get these two cards back in my hand from the Beaumont Courier. Is it possible for me to hit the correct string of lightning strikes and or... Ooh, here's Glimmer. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Because you know what Glimmer does? It digs you. Apparently it was five cards down. But you can also always draw a random other one rather than one that you've cast. Wow. Wow. And that, that opt looks like it's going to be enough. 
and then this is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, go to my turn. Yeah, this is going to be game one going to Alex Lloyd. I don't think Trey can interact here in any capacity, and that is the second one going on the stack. So let's head back to our main match as Alex Lloyd does pick up that first critical first game, I have to say, as well against the Mono Red deck. He is going to be very relieved to have that as they move into their sideboard games. It's not and something he was expecting either, no. I imagine. Now we've got Ben Stark versus Corey Baumeister. Game number two, Ben really put a thumping on Corey on that first game. It wasn't particularly close. He just had a great draw and was able to apply massive pressure to Corey, forcing him into some uh, bad blocks, some spots he didn't want to put himself into, and was able to punish him further for that. It's just one of those draws that came together beautifully for, for Stark. This one looks much slower, though, with Bomat Courier hitting a few times, but Ben still only on two lands. Yeah, and this is one of the disadvantages of Bomat Courier, is that if you're not hitting your land drops, then you end up with a clogged up, you know, fistful of cards, and yep. then you don't even want to sacrifice your Bomat Courier unless it starts getting really, really, really big. Um, ben, you know, missing land drops also, though, you know, means his hand is almost certainly chock full of removal spells. Oh, yeah, it's high-octane gasoline. There's no doubt about that. Corey's actually going to take this opportunity to use a Harness Lightning with that trigger on the stack. There's only three cards for Ben. He can't realistically sacrifice it and pitch his entire hand to it. Though, Ben can punish him if he did find a land here. And he did. And now he's going to play Rampaging Ferocidon. But that's going to get killed by Chandra's defeat. So Corey with all the answers here early. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's worth noting that it usually in this matchup, a uh, teamer has inevitability. And that's still true, even with Ben making his deck bigger. Ben's deck isn't bigger to the point where it has inevitability in these energy decks. It's bigger to the point of where it's better at pressing the advantage with mm. cards like Sand Strangler. So when they play their three drop, their Rogue Refiner or their World of Virtuoso, and he Sand Stranglers, it just becomes a nightmare for them. He is going to play a Sand Strangler after hitting his land drop this turn to Ben. That, of course, is just trading the trigger from Sand Strangler for three energy for Corey, but, you know, very importantly, it also leaves that plus one, plus one counter behind, which means that if Corey decides it is time for him to go on the offensive, he has a clean attack and in the Strangler. Absolutely, and, you know, Ben doesn't even have any mana up, so Corey knows it's absolutely safe. When you're playing this teamer against red matchup, turning the corner is one of the most important things. You need to apply pressure on the red opponent because they have so much reach in the form of cards like Remnant Ruins and Lightning Strike. So, you not only need to defend your life total, keep yourself alive, but you need to close out the game quickly before they're able to just draw, you know, nickel and dime burn spells or cards that uh, are just going to steal the game. So Corey now has to decide uh, if this is the time to turn the table. Chandra's defeat was beautiful there, by the way. Mm -hmm. It really was super efficient. Able to use two removal spells in one turn and then untap and play a Bristling Hider was a big game. And yes, Corey is attacking. He's looking to avenge his brother, Brad Nelson, who Ben Stark dispatched in the last round of Swiss to earn his seat in the top eight. It's all ba Baumeisters and Nelsons for Ben Stark. He does not have an easy road. <laughs> ahead of him, but he is up a game here, and he did beat Brad, so maybe he's just the uh, the nemesis. Yeah, Ben Stark is not an easy person to beat, no matter who you are. You can be a guy who's top eighted 10 Grand Prix in a row, and you still don't want to be playing against Ben Stark. Here we go. How about a Chandra? Yeah, this Chandra is going to allow him to kill that Long Tusk Cub. Yeah. Which is pretty important. Here, he wants to make sure that... Uh, this is interesting. Corey's like, small. well, maybe I have a Harness Lightning. Oh, boy. I think he does. He, if he does, he just needs to save one energy from it. And then he can cash it all in to make his cub a 5-5, five -five, and it will survive. At that seems like Chandra a pretty nice activation. play. Yeah. That's like paying two mana and instant speed for a 5-5. Five -five. I would do that. I would also do that. Corey would not. Corey, who is... Likely better at this format than either of us. Yes. He, would not. He is for sure better at this format than me. I don't, know, I don't know how much you've played, but... I played like 40 matches this week. Okay. Yeah. I played 10. 
That's pretty good. <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> it's not 40, and, and I'm sure Corey played more than both of us combined. So he's just going to go ahead and let his Long Tusk Cub die here. I got to say, if I'm in Ben's seat, I'm like, great. Yeah. I'm also, if I'm in Ben's seat, I'm like, you have a harness lighting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So Corey's going to go ahead and attack here. He does have a rather interesting decision. He's going to go for Chandra. But you could have imagined him going for Ben Stark's life total, thinking that he could assemble a two-turn clock with almost any other creature. Like that one. I mean, Corey also might have uh, just been playing around Ben having a shock yeah, to th back th up th the that Chandra. That makes a lot of sense. And that was the most yeah. obvious you know, uh, thing to play around there. Though... Do you do it? Maybe. I don't know. It's it's still just trading a one-for-one one card. And mm -hmm. if he doesn't have the shock, you get a 5-5 five, five for two mana. Yeah. It's kind of nice. It is true. I bet you the tiebreaker would have been if Corey could have killed a creature in addition. You know, if there was a one or two toughness creature that he could have killed. There just wasn't any good targets. All right. Well, old Sandy's going to pick a fight here. Yeah. And uh, again, Corey... He has to worry about Shock. what type of removal spells yep. Ben has. Like mm -hmm. If Ben has an abrade or a lightning strike, then this is a very dangerous block because he could end up losing four energy and his long tusk cub to whatever it is that Ben has in his hand. But my goodness, is attempting. Yeah, and this is what's so good about Ben's super removal heavy deck with all these instants is that it's constantly disincentivizing opponents from blocking. Mm hmm And what he played around last turn, now he no longer even has the option to play around it. And does he have it? Oh, there's the shock. Ben had it the whole time. And he's got another heart, or he's got that harness lightning still. So how much did it take? Three damage from the strangler. Yeah. And now there's two more coming in from the shock. So can he still save it? Let's see, he can get four energy and put two more counters on it. Yep. So that makes it a 6-6, six, six, and it's only taking 5 damage. So, oof. Yeah. Just by a whisker, he gets to keep that cat around. Now, Corey, by not saving his Long Tusk Cub on the turn previous, was able to do that. And you know what and he just did? Game. He just set up lethal. Yeah, he set up lethal. Because Corey had Glorybringer there to clear away that last 3-3 three, three on the ground and attack with Glorybringer plus his other two creatures, and that was exactly lethal, and he engineered a win there. Impressive stuff from Corey. Whoa. Corey Baumeister, ladies and gentlemen. That was, uh, that was, that was some clutch play. Because, you know, I got to say, I like how Ben played that, too. Yeah, Ben you know? was also playing really, really nice. Yeah. Ben, ben was constantly, like, volleying Corey to put him in the situation where he had to make mistakes. And Corey, and Corey just, just refused. Maneuvered. Yeah, he yeah. just maneuvered. And th but then when, it, when push came to shove, he had the answer that he needed to keep his cub alive, and Bingo, bango. That's game number two going to Corey Baumeister. So we're going to get a game number three out of them. I love that. And these games have just been amazing. Mm. Really cool games. Yeah, I'm really excited about Ben's version of this deck. It's uh, one of the better innovations this weekend. Sand Strangler's really good right now. That card could be good in other decks, too. Strength so. Sand Strangler's been good for days. Actual days. Yeah, and standard probably <laughs> just days. <but> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it really is good for against the last, Teamer, like, though. Four days yeah. this card has been. But against premium. Teamer, it's like legit. Oh, absolutely. It just um, kills most of the things that they play. <laughs> especially when you're on the play. I mean, it just feels disgusting when they play one of their three drops and you pay four mana and you get a 3 3 and kill their three drop. You know, like somebody, when you play a card like Rogue Refiner, it just feels like pure value. You're like, oh, I'm drawing a card, I'm getting two energy, and I'm getting this 3-2. Well, when they play their Sand Strangler, it's essentially like, you know, you paid three mana to draw a card, and your opponent paid four mana to make a 3-3. Three, three. And I'd much rather pay four mana for a 3-3 three, three than pay three mana to draw a card. <laughs> Looks this like Corey just up so uh, well. stepped away from the table for just a short minute, but I actually see him walking back over now from our position in the booth. If you're just joining us, we're at Grand Prix Atlanta. We just followed up GP Warsaw after they finished earlier this afternoon. 
And now we're right into the top eight here. We watched the last few rounds of Swiss. And we've got the two biggest names facing off here in the quarterfinals. That's Corey Baumeister in his fourth constructed GP top eight in a row. Playing as a Hall of Famer? And now he's playing against <laughs> Ben Stark. And a l little bit of an interesting sub story is that Ben actually played Corey's brother, Brad Nelson, the bard himself, in round number 15, knocking him out of the top eight and securing his own seat. So Corey gets to try to fight him. Let's jump back over, though, to Trey Van Cleve and Alex Lloyd. So this is just game two. Trey here on the play has that one drop. Does he have the two, three to follow it up? Oh, it looks like Trey mulliganed a lot. Not a lot to work with here for Van Cleve. He is down a game against the Esper approach deck. This could get sketchy for him. Last time we checked in on this, uh, Alex had already played an approach to the second sun, and he used an opt as well as a glimmer of genius to dig to the second copy, put it on the stack, and that was all she wrote. It looks like Trey's hand, though, isn't the worst here. You know, he only has four cards left because of those mulligans, but he has a third land, and he has two copies of Rampaging Ferocidon along with a Chandra Torture Defiance. That's good. That's real nice. Unless, of course, it gets censored, meaning that all you've got left is a Soul Scar Mage. That is very good for Alex to maintain that board presence here of uh, just facing down the one two. Yeah, and I mean, 20 turns is a very long time. What's scary, too, is because Trey's mulligan so much, you know, he doesn't have the luxury of waiting to play around cards like Sensor. He really just has to power his spells directly into them. Well, did Alex pass the turn here? He did. He didn't hit that land. Oh, boy, that is majorly bad news for Alex Lloyd. It's a land off the top from Trey, and that is actually a very good draw for him because I see another Sensor in hand for Alex. So if Trey just plays it pre-combat, he can actually run out that second copy of Ferocidon. Now, if he gets greedy and goes for Chandra here, that will not work out well for him. Yes, so Trey playing really nicely here, playing around that sensor. Very smart. That Ferocidon. And that's going to actually prompt Alex to cycle. Actually, I spoke a little too soon. It's an op that he's going to play instead. But that means that there's no counters available, though it looks like he pu put a land in his hand. Yeah, a little bit surprising that he didn't use that op during his main phase. I think he just to wanted to leave up land. sensor. Yeah. Which is risky business against good players like Trey. And he may just have to burn an energy here to cycle. Ugh, not what he wants to be doing, but it looks like he's got most of his mana lined up because he did draw a white mana source with concealed courtyard, so it shouldn't punish him too badly. But he is now facing down a rampaging for us as well as that soul scar mage, and that is a significant clock. And he also doesn't have double blue now because of the way he cycled that sensor. And I'm, I'm not sure if Disallow would remain in his deck in post boarded games against Trey, but it certainly is not going to be an option on this turn. Awkward. But he was feeling the pressure. Absolutely. He was feeling that heat coming around the corner. He had to cycle that sensor in his mind and make sure he keeps hitting these land drops. He knew he was going to hit one that turn because he... Hit one with the opt, but still, I think he's really feeling that the like not using his mana on given turns is going to come back and bite him. So he just felt pressure to do so. Here comes Chandra with two sensors already in the graveyard. It feels a little bit Trey, safer this time. Yeah, around. Trey just says, "Oh, I'm just going to run it out there because you're unlikely to have a oh, sensor." The third sensor. Man, Alex has it all here. Who needs double blue for your disallow when you've got three sensors in a row? They never play around the third one. And I don't really think that Trey had the opportunity to anyway. You say go there? It wouldn't have made sense. It was a smart play by him to run out Chandra in most scenarios there. Absolutely. I mean, now he's left with just a Beaumont Courier. Oh, it looks like he got an Earthshaker Kenra too, so he can get a little bit aggressive here. Though, this is a little bit scary because suddenly Settle the Wreckage becomes backbreaking. It might be settle the match. Yes. If he has it. Especially if Trey just moves all in here and plays the Earthshaker. Which I imagine he will. I mean, that's seven damage, and he gets the Bomat career rolling. That is a 
tough thing to give up on. But if he does get settled here, I, yeah, I would I, almost just call it for Alex right on the spot. I feel like he needs to go for it here. I mean, you're on the mulligan. You can't give your opponent much time. You know, when you play around things, I think what he did earlier by playing around that sensor, that was beautiful. That was exactly what he needed to do. But I think that it's worth noting that you need to find out what is worth playing around. Because if you play around something and by playing around it, you're making yourself lose the game, then it's not worth playing around it. But if you're playing around things where even if you're wrong, you're still putting yourself in a position to win the game, that's, that's a the edge mistake. where you're picking up. Yeah. Exactly, yep. Don't do that thing where you play around a card you can't beat anyway. That, yeah. is, that is not going to be good. But I want to see here if he has to settle the wreckage because I didn't get a great look at his hand. I also want to see if, Dr if Trey decides to play around it in any capacity. I'd be really impressed if Trey was able to play around it. I mean, he could just not attack with every creature, right? Leave himself something. Yeah, it's weird, though, because... It Unless you attack with everything but for Asanon, you're leaving yourself with basically nothing. Mm. Right? That's true. Yeah, so. Asanon's far and away the best attacker that Trey has here. Oh, and he is going to play around it. Very interesting. Cute. All right, he's thinking. He's setting up these attacks. He sure is. Yeah, so he's going to send with, it looks like everybody except the Earthshaker Kenra. And there is a Settle the Wreckage there for okay. Alex Lloyd. Well, let's head back. It sounds like our table A is ready to go, and this one's moving a little slowly. We will certainly have updates on it. But I want to make sure that we keep up on that one and not get too far ahead. All right, so we've got, it looks like a Bomat Courier with a ton of cards under it, as well as a Sand Strangler facing down against a Long Tusk Cub. Yeah, now. Welp. This is terrifying. That Bomat Courier can. Five cards under it? Do a lot, a lot of work. That means it was played on turn one and has just attacked every single turn since. Yeah, you can see that a Corey's graveyard is littered with servants of the conduit. Which have eaten shocks from mm -hmm. the looks of things. Shock and probably Sand Strangler. But this is a big play here from Corey. He's going to fight back with Bristling Hydra. And shields are now up for Corey. How is Ben going to get through a Bristling Hydra? Those are a pain. Wow, he's attacking with Bomat Courier. What is he going to do? Activate it right now. Yeah, he understands. This Bomat Courier is not getting in. But this Bomat Courier is going to fill my hand back up, find me exactly what I need to win this game. Corey down to nine already. Those Roman Ruins starting to look a little bit dangerous. Oh, absolutely. Though, as we saw last turn, or excuse me, last game, Corey Baumeister can turn the tides very quickly. I mean, he attacked for 14 on that last turn in one hit. And he's got two energy-hungry creatures here, but either one that he decides to sink the energy into are responsible for a heck of a lot of damage as well. Yeah, and those can... Either of them could end the game in short order for him. Mm -hmm. Now, he needs to leave back some amount of blocking for the Sand Strangler, but either one of those creatures is going to be strong enough to do so. Let's see what Ben has. Sand Strangler again. Again, he just keeps forcing the uh, activations here from Corey. But it, like you said, there's no attack possible, though. As uh, Four Toughness and Hexproof, Bristling Hydra says stop sign to that first Sand Strangler. And this is quite interesting because here we're seeing that Sand Strangler, you know, is actually not very strong against Bristling Hydra in specific. And it costs the same amount of mana. Mm. However, it's so good 
against cards like Long Tusk Cub, Rogue Refiner, and Whirler Virtuoso. So here Ben is playing you know, this card that's great against exactly what his opponent is playing, but his opponent still has a card in the deck that is just a clear trump at the same mana cost, it's just showing us how powerful this teamer strategy really is. Corey attacking a bit there with the Long Tusk Cub, generating some energy. I like that play. Recognizes that with all Ben Stark's mana tapped, he's not going to be uh, blocking it all. It's a free two energy that Corey could pick up here. The Long Tusk Cub. Quite strong against these red decks. As is Bristling Hydra, the green energy creatures match up very well against the current red decks, especially when they don't have access to Harsh Mentor. Okay, Corey's going to line up and attack with his two green creatures here, crashing into the double sand stranglers with lots of mana for Ben Stark. But, I, you know, I got to say, if I'm in Corey's seat, I'm really feeling the pressure of needing to start making something happen as far as damage goes towards Ben because of those Ramanap ruins. It's just 2-2-2-2, two, 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 game's over, and, you know, it's easy yeah. for Ben to pepper in a shock or something in there as well to, you know, maybe bring some glory or whatever, and that clock gets even smaller. What has Ben got here? Lightning strike your face. Okay, it puts none to five. Make that three. After he activates Ramp, Ramanop Ruins, and, and there's it. one damage from Sunscorched Desert, and yep. boom! Activate the Ramanop Ruins, and wow. Ben Stark has the reach to get the job done there, taking Corey from 8 to 0 with a on your end step, and boom, he's dead yep. before he even gets another turn. So The only card he even really used was a Lightning Strike. Yep. You know, he just drew that desert. Wow, dealt Corey one that was and had exact damage with the Ramanap ruins. What do you think? Uh, what do you think Corey and Brad are going to talk about at dinner tonight? Like, you know, I never really liked Ben Stark that much anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's funny because both of them like him a lot. I know. Yeah, I yeah. Know. yeah. What's, <laughs> up with, what's up with the basketball shorts all the time? I know. Yeah, oh man, what's it bothers with that guy? me too. You know, Jeez. <laughs> he just mowed right through them. They'll probably <laughs> honestly be rooting for him at this point since now well, if they can't win it anyway, a good friend of theirs. May as well take it down. Ben Stark secures his seat in the semifinals, knocking out Corey Baumeister after knocking out Brad Nelson to get into the top eight. So mows right through the two teamer decks, but it's not surprising because that's why Ben made the changes to the deck that he made. And, uh, you know, that does set him up to, uh, to cruise here if he can keep playing against teamer decks. Regal Caracal on the stack for Alex Lloyd. That seems that's, pretty nice against the more traditional That's a way to not Ramanap die. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Although this does look very sketchy here as Trey Van Cleave is going to activate Ramanop Ruins and put Alex down to four. And it's easy to imagine that Alex is at a virtual two life here. A burn spell off the top would earn the game for Trey Van Cleave. It was Hazaret the Fervent. That actually does not quite get the job done here. No, it's not good enough. Now, I don't know how close Alex is to perhaps casting, I don't know what, a sweeper? I actually don't know what he needs here. He's only got six mana, so he can't have played approach yet. I suppose just casting your first approach would be pretty nice. Yeah, it's going to gain you seven life. Yeah, and he still has the board, you know, not destroyed, though. Trey has a reasonable attack here. Yeah, I mean, Alex, he's going to gain a little bit of life when he blocks these yeah. guys but yeah he could he can double block to kill the 4-4 chump gain two in the transaction so he'd be at six facing down Hazaret with no board Ugh. turns out Hazaret was a pretty good rip there for Trey Van Cleave and these cats currently uh, two power each of them going to mm -hmm. gain two life off that life link. Very important. Yeah, it looks like he may be considering just putting the two cats. Either way, it doesn't matter. Yeah, and it was four life, by the way. I misspoke. So it actually put him yeah. to eight. 
but still, board state wise, it's the same, and it doesn't look amazing for Alex here. Now, Alex, I mean, he has a fumigate in hand, but fumigate's not very good when you're facing off against half fervent. Yeah, and so he's going to just go ahead and order them. And the same thing's going to happen that we described. He's going to lose Alex's board. He's going to go to eight life, which is important. It means he can take a Hazaret hit plus an activation from Hazaret now. But That's exactly where you want to be. He's going to need it. He's going to need every bit of life he can get here. Cycling sensor. Can't be where he wants to be. No land drop go. Now, of course, Settle the Wreckage comes to mind here. But the truth is, is that Trey just doesn't need to bother. Although, Alex says he's at four. He is at eight, right? I believe he's at eight. Those cats had lifelink last turn. For sure. This yeah. Is, so he, to three. He's going to go to three here. Virtual one. Yeah. Yeah, now, I mean, he has the also, ruins plus card. Plus discard a card, plus draw step. <laughs> yeah. So no settle the wreckage from Alex Lloyd is a big problem here because straight is jammed. Would have been a great answer. Yeah, Alex clearly does not have either cast out and or settle. You see one settle the wreckage in his graveyard. Trey's uh, double checking, it sounds like, life totals. We may see an interesting uh, disallow Ramadap Ruins trigger, or, or activation, rather. <laughs> He's not even going to bother. Trey actually just looked like he couldn't believe it. He just sat there for a minute after Alex started scooping. But uh, Trey does win game number two. And that means that we've got one game to decide this particular match and see who's going to be into the semis. The Trey picks up that game two there. The match does get a little bit harder post sideboard, but I think that uh, game three is going to be really rough for Trey being both on the draw and in a post sideboard match. Take a look at uh, if there's any spice in Trey Van Cleve's deck here. Anything Alex Lloyd. Sweet? Um, no, it looks like uh, Trey Van Cleve's deck is. Just about card for card, exact. Uh, at least the main deck is exactly the same as Daniel Fournier's deck from uh, the Pro Tour, which was a 9-1 standard deck at Pro Tour Ixalan. Um, major difference here between that deck is that there are uh, there's one more Harsh Mentor and one less Karizev. Besides that, the main deck's the same. Uh, if we take a look at Alex Lloyd's deck, Alex Lloyd is playing a deck that's very similar to uh, Jan Matignon's deck from the Pro Tour. Alex, however, has found room for a pair of Fumigate in the main deck. And what's interesting to me is that the Fumigates in the main deck for these uh, Approach the Second Sun decks this weekend might have actually been a surprise for opponents. Because mm. if you remember last week, Matignon had no Fumigates. No. Anywhere in his 75. That's the deck I've been playing, by the way. Oh, it's a fun one. Yeah, it's yeah. real sweet. And but no, no fumigates, no sweepers, just settles. Yeah, and I think one of the major advantages that Matt and Jan had is that his opponents would actively play around fumigate, and they would not play around settle. And as a result, it gave the deck a big play edge against a lot of opponents. Now, here, Alex Lloyd, he has fumigate in his blue-white approach deck. So... By playing Fumigate in this deck now, people might play around your Satellite Wreckage, not attack you with everything. Then you're taking less damage, and you untap and you cast Fumigate, and they're probably fuming because they know your deck list. They've played against the decks at the top eight of the Pro Tour. You know, they had 
they had their friends put together those decks. They were playing against them all week to practice for this tournament. And now you're playing that deck that top the Pro Tour, only you found room for Fumigate? That's obnoxious. I like it. <laughs> I like jockeying like that. That's cool. I like it a lot. So we've got some other updates here, by the way, from our quarterfinals. Uh, we've got Petter Sahurik versus Lawrence Vess. Lawrence wins that match two games to zero, knocking out Petter. And then uh, on our other one, we had uh, Sergio Garcia playing against Sam Zakreski. And uh, that one was Sergio, two to zero. So he is in. So it's Ben S. Sergio and Lawrence Vess. And then one of these two gentlemen will be joining them, depending on who wins this next game. Trey Van Cleve or Alex Lloyd. So interesting. We have a Mardu Vehicles deck already through to the top four. Here we're going to have either Ramanap Red or Esper Approach. Um, we have a four-color energy deck that's playing Gonti Lord of Luxury in addition to a whole bunch of other fan favorites. Hostage Taker. Let's, all, let's give it up for Hostage Taker. Come I, on, lo guys. I yeah, love come me on. a Hostage I also <laughs> love, I love Gonti, too, though. Yeah, so do I. That I think those just sweet. Do you think Gonti is the most luxurious card in standard right now, or do you think that Hostage Taker has overtaken it as f in terms of no. luxury? No, no it's, it's definitely Gonti. Gonti, he's still... He's the lord of luxury. Yeah, that's true. Hostage Taker is just like a bad person. Just stealing stuff and sometimes stealing people for profit? Oh, man, I guess that's true. Can't say I I'm a fan. about it from a flavor perspective. Now, Gonti. He's got a lot of nice necklaces, some yeah, watches. Yeah. I was more thinking like couches and blankets. Blankets? <laughs> it's like luxury. Lug I guess there are different ways to think about, you know, luxury. You're more thinking about it in terms of like luxury tax, you know? Uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking about like luxury items. Yeah. I wish these guys would start playing now. Yeah, that'd, that'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we did really break down the hostage taker versus <laughs> Gonti luxury comparison yeah, yeah. in great detail, but I think that uh, I wouldn't mind seeing some Magic the Gathering on the screen. If you're just joining us, we're in the quarterfinal finals here in Atlanta. I think Trey Mulligan to five. I am with Jacob Van Lunen. And it looks like some mulligans here from Trey. And mulligans for both players. The bottom for Alex, the top for Trey. And a Bomac career kicks things off here for Trey Van Cleve. So he's in the red zone and starting to pile up cards. You know, this can really make a mulligan feel not as bad if you just empty out the few cards you had and then reload off of a Bomac career. And That's these the cards can be problematic for decks like what Alex is playing because they're usually geared a little bit more towards killing multiple creatures at once rather than one at a time. They'll have a few tools to do it, but, you know, sometimes these little Bomac Couriers get a lot of work done. Yeah, and the thing is, is Bomac Courier, when you're playing against most decks in the format, you know, they play a two-drop, and the Bomac Courier stops attacking unless you have a removal spell or your opponent tries to turn the table. When you're playing against a deck like Esper Approach, they're not playing any creatures to invalidate that Bomac Courier, so they need to use an active card. They need to use something like Settle the Record, something like Fumigate, to actually get it off the table and deal with things. Because with Alex Lloyd's deck, he's not playing creatures to block that Beaumont Courier. He's going to need a spell to get it off the table. And before he's able to do that, there's a chance that it might have just piled up enough cards in its little uh, messenger bag. But it does not. It's kicked off the curb. Car hits it. Sometimes that happens. You're out delivering letters, and you get pushed around a little bit. Soulscar Mage is the only creature standing now for Trey Van Cleve with Alex at 18 life. Hitting his land drops. Uh, this one's starting to slip away. It's looking a little bit scary There's here. There's a Ferocidon. Oh, but it's going to get censored, and that's a, another huge swing in Alex Lloyd's direction. There's a fast censor, too. The moment he saw those lands tapped, he was ready. He knew. You also saw him hold it over the table. Yeah. <laughs> There's an Ether hub for Lloyd. Land number four, go. 
I know it doesn't look like a whole lot's going on. But you can see that each step has been in Alex Lloyd's favor. Now, this is going to be a shotter. If this resolves... That's a big problem for Alex if this resolves. Oh, he's going to go for an opt. Oh, and he shows that he hit, too. Wow. Oh, man. He didn't even do the I'll keep it, shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. He was just like, boom, I hit disallow off the top. Some shenanigans from Alex Lloyd. Yeah, that's a little uh, a little much. I, you know, I don't know. I'm it's a turning little... The, turning the, the knife a little, a little bit. bit. It is a little bit, although, you know, although I like, maybe I mean, you're he the, just wanted to hide to... it. I, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Maybe least. you're getting a mental edge, you know? Well, like, do you hide? Do you do you hide any information? Do you do you do you make your opponent think that you don't have a counter spell in hand by doing that? Maybe you do, and maybe that's why he did. Maybe I he mean, has another counter spell. We're going like way too deep for what was just like him going. Oh, I found it. You know, hitting you. Oh, but, absolutely. <laughs> but I mean, look, I will say if I'm sitting in Trey's seat, I'd say it's a little less likely that he has one in his hand. Oh, and there's sensor number two, and you can see the mannerisms from Alex Lloyd as he just slammed that sensor on the table to counter Hazaret the fervent. Oh, That's got to feel pretty nice. Yeah. If you're sitting in Alex's seat, he's going to be thrilled. Trey has been knocked around this game, though. No fun at all from him. He's going to have to settle for carries have plus a Bomac career this turn. Yeah, so, I mean, He's at least going to be getting in for two. He's pressuring Alex's life total a little bit. But next turn, Alex is already at approach to the second sun mana. Yeah. Trey doesn't have a Rampage of Veracity on in play. It just does not feel good for Trey. No, he had a Rampaging Veracity on countered by Sensor. He had Chandra countered by an opted into Disallow. And then he had Hazaret countered by another Sensor. Still, he's fighting. Like, if, if Alex is out of gas... He draws his card for the turn. He looks at it. He's only got one other card. <laughs> it's Fumigate oh off my the top. Goodness. And he again doesn't even bother shuffling. He's like, I am top Jeez. decking you, and you are going to know about it. See, now Trey's got to decide whether or not he wants to trade the card in his hand for a Which random is, card underneath Beaumont Courier. Glory bringer. Oh, so he has a glory bringer in hand. But the thing is, is by sacrificing the Mount Courier, he's also preventing Alex from getting a, one extra life off that Fumigate. So... Plus minus here. He's going to choose to just let it die. Keep that glory, glory bringer in hand that way. If he draws the land, it's not necessarily a dead card. It means he's going to put a 4-4 flying haste into play. Right. If he could find an untapped mana source there, instead he drew... Lightning strike. A lightning strike. Yeah. Not really what he wanted to see there. Not at all. Now what does Alex have? He, he drew an opt for the turn. Bottom. Draw a card. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Land go. I like how he shuffles Curtis. the land when he draws the land. Yeah. When he draws the few, he just slams it just on the slams table. It. All right, now we're going to see Glorybringer, but I, I believe that it settled the wreckage that's left for Alex. He says, "Sure, bang, settle the wreckage right at you, Trey Van Cleve." That gets exiled. You can go get a land, and now both players are officially out of gas. This has to favor Alex, but you'll notice that the window grows small because if Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So approach Alex, the second Alex, stop interrupting sun. me with your top decks, man. <laughs> approach of the second sun right off the top of the library, like a champion for Alex Lloyd. Means that Trey Van Cleve, though, he does still have a window. You know, a lot of his creatures hit really hard, and a lot of them have haste. So he actually does have a window to get in a lot of damage if he can rip. Well, as well as Alex has this game, let's just yes. give it to you straight. <laughs> He All needs right. to find Hazaret. Yes. He Hazaret's and Glory Bringers. Glory Bringers. Even then, it's hard, though, because... Well, look, if he goes Hazaret right now, and Alex draws a couple of lands in a row, it, it gets down pretty quickly. That's true. He drew That's a, true. a mini version of Hazaret. <laughs> Earthshaker Kenra? Yeah, very mini version of yeah, Hazaret. Yeah. It's going to take 11 turns for that one. To yeah, do that's not going to get the job done on its own. But he does have the lightning strike. He does have Ramanap Ruins. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my God. This is Who is disgusting. this guy? What in the world? 
Like, it's just a parade of cats. Regal Caracal. This is like a. a this this, this just match is just like the internet. Like, you know, it's like a bunch of unexpected things that are like the most impactful things happening in a row, followed by a bunch of cats. Unbelievable. <laughs> Let's see if Trey can rip back it here. Oh, is that a Hazaret? Is it? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. Business. All right. We got business. All right, Trey in there with the hazard and the earth shaker. Can you Kenra. imagine if Trey were to win this game? That would be absurd. <laughs> just that would just be absurd. So Alex gonna just chump that hazard right there. He's gonna definitely approach go to off 19. the top, right? <laughs> That's oh even worse. God, oh my god! Oh my Caracal. god! Are you this kidding is just, me? This is too much for me. And that's a smart attack from Alex. He's going to get in for two with life. Like this is just unbelievable. Oh my! Come goodness. on, glory bringer Trey. Just the one. Oh, finally he just draws a land. I I do not see how Trey can beat a draw like this. This is just unbelievable. Yeah, it was. It, Alex had the perfect answer for whatever question Trey had asked the turn before. I got sitting give, on the top of his library gotta each a, and every I got to give a lot of credit to Trey. He has just been calmly plugging away. You know, you don't see him throw his hands up in the air or flip the table or do anything <laughs> crazy, yeah. but this is a frustrating game <laughs> for yes. him. This is certainly a very frustrating situation to be in. What is it, Alex? Oh, he finally just passed the turn. Okay. Is this a perhaps a reprieve for Trey Van Cleef? Well, the problem is, is that it what reprieve do? does not oh, serve him well okay. because approach of the second sons is looming. Yeah, yeah, and it, right. it's, it's going like, to be here it's soon. Like two or three cards down. Right? It is. And that's yes. How it's, yes, you are completely correct about that, yeah. Jake. And this game is going to end with that because I don't see a way for Trey Van Cleef to fight through uh, three two two lifelink cats here, as well as the Regal Caracal itself in that time frame, right? I mean, even if it's land, land, land approach, I don't think that Trey can win this game. There's a disallow off the top as well for Alex, which really just seals the deal. Trey did decide to play carry Zev rather than throw the card at Alex's face. <laughs> in frustration? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm joking. <laughs> not literally, Jake, not literally. <laughs> So yeah, no, no, he's uh, he's very calm and collected about this whole thing. It's uh, this is going to be a rampaging ferocidon now for Van Cleve, but you know that life gain doesn't matter anymore if he can resolve the uh, the approach that's coming up in a turn or two. It's not going to matter anyway, and it doesn't. Alex just says, "Look, I I'm countering anything at this point of relevance," and he views rampaging for us on as, as relevant and the main reason for that is because he gets to maintain the lifelink on his cat so that they become better blockers yeah i think rampaging for us is about the second best card trait could have cast there even behind glory bringer so agreed and he's going to pass the turn back here but i think it's next turn that the approach yeah, is it's, coming it's either here. next turn or the turn after so right so this just one's over. just in the books here i and I'm not surprised to say that after the absurd rips that Alex Lloyd has pulled off the top of his library here, really leaving Trey, who had mulligan this game, by the way. Yeah. Just a beaten man at this point. So here's Hazaret, and Alex is just going to cash in a cat here to effectively gain seven life. Yeah, so... Go jumping up to, up to 21. 21. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's and just, there's nothing he can do. So let's so see. So this game the advantage bar is all the way to the right. Okay, so it's the next card yeah, yeah. then. It is the next card. Yep. <laughs> and it is cats versus dogs here on the battlefield. And, uh, well, cats is winning. Yeah, I take umbrage with that. I don't. I have a cat, not a dog. Yeah, I have a dog. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a 17-year-old yeah, blind and deaf dog. Your, do your dog is awesome. Though. She's a cool dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Trey is still fighting the fight here. He's going to cast an Earthshaker Kenra, but tick-tock, and this one's going to be done. Alex says, yeah, sure, man. That cat can't block. And at 21. Yeah, the problem is that he's had to leave back Hazaret uh, a couple of turns in the interim here because if he tacked with Hazaret, 
then Alex could crack back and actually gain more life <laughs> yeah. with the cats. He has started to attack with Hazaret as of last turn, though. Yeah, I mean, now he can actually start making his way through the cats, but as we all know, the second sun is coming. It seems like it's inevitable at this point. Though Trey, he plays one way. To win. Yeah. He's just in battle mode. Can't blame him. And I mean, you have to try to win the best you can. You're here. You're in a Grand Prix top eight. And oh no, really? Settle the wreckage one at a time, lands. Oh my god! <laughs> this is disgusting. This is oh my just goodness! Repulsive. Trey, Trey is gonna say, "Hold on a sec. I'm gonna throw this card at you with Hazaret, but it is super not relevant at this point." Uh, <laughs> and the Kenras even get exiled. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They do. Yeah. They do. So they're not coming back. Enjoy oh, your lands. Celebrate for a bunch of lands. I think Trey actually kept a land in his hand for some reason there as well, rather than chucking it. I mean, 21, 19. <laughs> your opponent's got those cats in play. I kind of like just throwing it at the face, but... Oh, of course, but... And there it is, approach of the second sun. Yes. That one, not a top deck. <laughs> yeah, that, that one, he knew about that we one. We knew that one was coming, and that is our last semifinalist oh. being set there. That is Alex Lloyd joining Ben Stark, Sergio Garcia, and Lawrence Vest. We'll be back with the semifinals after these messages.